Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending uh, this webinar hosted by the Fishery Secretariat on forage fish in the Baltic Sea. Um, we've uh, rescheduled this a couple of times because we really wanted to uh, also have a little bit of attention for forage fish in the North Sea, as there was some interesting development around the UK. And we're very, very grateful that uh, Amy Sesford and Berenthild Butfield will uh, join us in a Q&A session after our presentations on the Baltic. Um, as you have seen from the agenda, we have we were supposed to have first a presentation by Dina Birgerson on the Baltic uh, the forage fish ecology in the Baltic. Um, OK, uh, I see a raised hand. Uh, I cannot unmute uh, attendees. There is a Q, but I was going to come. That there is a Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. This is where we can leave comments and uh, questions. Uh, or also, I see it's from Charles. So Charles, you can also text Sarah because she has the same. She has. She is the the the, the in charge of uh, the the back office of the Zoom of, of the Zoom call while I'm speaking. So uh, if you do that, that'll, I'm sure you and Sarah can sort out. Uh, out. But so uh, what I was saying is in the agenda originally, it was first Lena, then Sarah. We flipped it around because Sarah's presentation is a very nice introduction to what we're doing and why we've started this project on forage fish. Um, and that, and we will repeat, um, there is a QA. So we have, because of, the, we're using Zoom webinars, which is different from normal Zoom chat. The, the chat function is disabled for attendees, just for panelists can use the chat for some reason. Um, and uh, But instead of that, we have a Q&A function. It's next to the chat function at the bottom of your screen. You should be able to put, post any questions in there. And also uh, attendees can comment on each other questions in there. So if somebody posts a question and you know the answer, as uh, you can actually comment on that. Two. Um, uh, and I think that's it. So yeah. Um, so after the Lina and Sarah have given their presentations, we have a short. We will take take a few moments for questions. So just post those in the Q and A session section. And uh, after that, we will go to the Q and A session with uh, Imogen, Bernadette, and Ian. Um, and we'll start that up with a very short presentation by Amy. So with more further ado, I will hand over to Sarah to start her presentation. Yes, I will now share my screen. And I hope you can see it. And let's see. Do you see it now? Yes. OK, perfect. Uh, then I will have a, um, a very short introduction of the new project. My name is Sarah Soderstrom, and I will present shortly the new project, Small Fish, Big Impact, the Importance of Forage Fish. And welcome everybody for uh, who wants to listen to this. So I'm the policy officer at FishSec. I have a PhD in environmental science from Linköping University in Sweden. And my past research include ecosystem-based management in the Baltic Sea marine environment and also uh, about marine national parks in Sweden and the obstacles and enables for them to uh, function or not. So a very short introduction again on Small Fish Big Impact. The project is funded by the Swedish Postcode Foundation. Thank you very much. And also co-funding comes from the Swedish Agency for Marine and Water Management. Um, it is a two and a half year project. It started already last year in September and it will continue until February, 2026. A short background of the project is basically that forage fish, they do play a, a very important role in the ecosystem, but they do receive little public attention perhaps with the exception of Swedish news media reporting about herring. And the latest scientific advice on herring in the Baltic Sea shows downward trends, and also the absolute majority of forage fish caught in the Baltic Sea is used for fish meal, not for human consumption. 
And the aim is better management of forest fish stocks aligned with ecosystem boundaries and also awareness raising of the importance of forage fish among the public and other stakeholders. Uh, and the scope here is the Baltic Sea and uh, the North Sea. So these are um, uh, graphs from the latest ISIS advice on the Baltic uh, forage fish stocks. Of the four herring stocks, you have the Bothnian herring, Central Baltic herring, uh, the Western Baltic spring spawning herring and the Rika herring, you can see that there is a downward trend for all of them except the Riga herring, which is doing fine. But if you look at the map, you can see that the Riga herring is located in a very small area of the Baltic Sea. This is subdivision 28.1, as you can see in purple on the map. Um, so this is the only one, the only herring stock that is doing fine. The rest are not doing fine and Sprat is doing fairly okay. But for the last two years, the recruitment has not been very good. So this, this is the backdrop of uh, the herring stocks and Lena will talk more about this in a few minutes. Um, so what activities are we planned in this project? Uh, we're gonna write and distribute a report compiling the latest scientific knowledge about forage fish. And from this report, we will develop and spread recommendations on ecosystem-based management for forest fish. Uh, also, a lot of activities will take place based on the report on uh, social media and in real life. And more webinars like this one will follow. So please keep in touch. Uh, this is a very short uh, or crude uh, timeline. You can see that now we are in the process of writing the report and starting with the webinars. And then we will continue with a lot of different social media activities and also in real life activities all around the Baltic Sea. A major public activity will take place uh, next year. And throughout the whole project, we will do analysis of different occurrences and processes that takes place throughout the so-called fish management years. This is because fisheries management has an uh, annual cycle. So uh, extremely crude, uh, the fish year where we kind of follow all the events that happens. Uh, you can see that the commission asks ISIS for advice on fishing opportunities. And uh, from that request, ISIS produces the advice based on the latest data samplings and knowledge. And these advices, they are released normally for the Baltic Sea that is in the end of May. And based on those uh, advice, the commission releases a proposal uh, on the fishing opportunities for the upcoming year. And this proposal is then discussed in the member states and uh, negotiated in the council meetings in October for the Baltic Sea and in December for the North Sea. And uh, we do uh, analysis of the all of these events throughout the year as part of the projects as well. So uh, a very short introduction of the uh, Small Fish Big Impact project. Uh, I thank you for listening. I will now give the word to Lina for some uh, more um, in detail um, discussions on forage fish. And I will also try to find where I stop sharing my screen. So thank you very much, Lina, to you. Thank you. I hope you can see my screen now and that you can hear me as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, great. So my name is Lina Biljersson. I'm also from FISHEC and I will be presenting the report that we're working on in our Small Fish Big Impact project, uh, particularly the part focused on the importance of forage fish for the biological aspects and the ecosystem of the Baltic Sea. Let's see if I can change this. Yes, okay. I will start with uh, a short introduction and a very basic level on uh, what it's like to live in the Baltic Sea for fish uh, and background on what sport fish are, uh, why they're important, as well as examples from our literature review that's currently ongoing. So uh, I am, uh, my background is that I'm a biologist I did my PhD at the University of Gothenburg 
and I've been uh, researching effects of environmental chemicals uh, in fish. And I'm now co-authoring this uh, port fish report that we're working on. Uh, the report will partially consist of a literature review. It's going to summarize the situation uh, for port fish in the Baltic Sea. And it's similar uh, in the setup to our COD project, but this project is a follow-up to. Uh, with the that uh, with Baltic COD did a, a report as well. Uh, with the literature review in it, but the Forge Fish literature review is going to be available later this year once we launch it, and we'll hold another webinar then. Uh, keep in mind that the summary now of the re review is not new results that we've produced, it's just a summary of existing scientific knowledge. Uh, so the method for the literature review is uh, starting out with a literature search using the Scopus uh, database, and predefined criteria. And then you get a number of hits of different papers that have been peer reviewed and published, uh, including research papers, review papers, uh, also a few books and conference abstracts. But the main bulk of our report will be based on um, the research papers, uh, mainly published over the last 10 years, as well as so-called gray literature, which has not been peer reviewed, but is very much relevant still, including ISIS reports, for instance. The literature search then goes through a selection process where we split them into relevancy categories and either include them in the report or exclude them. Uh, and exclusion criteria can be, for instance, if they were not relevant for the geographic scope of our study or if they were concerning the wrong species or, or if the language is something that we cannot read, which is not, not English or not Swedish. Uh, here is just a simple word cloud that I did uh, with all the uh, headings of the papers that came up. Uh, and you can see that there's a lot of different topics that are being researched. I've split them into these uh, different categories. And the final report will also have a comparison with the North Sea in it as well. But the presentation today will be focused on the uh, predators that eat swordfish, the competition uh, in between different transports, uh, changes in the ecosystem and what the uh, forge fish themselves eat as well. Uh, so very basic, what are forge fish? Well, they are small to medium-sized pelagic fish. Uh, forge species also include non-fish species, such as uh, quill, for instance. But today we'll look only at the fish, uh, forge fish. Uh, they typically gather in large groups and school together. Uh, they are generally very productive and have shorter lifespans than the predators, which can lead to um, a more volatile abundance, sort of uh, where the amount of available prey shifts faster than the, uh, the predators do, because they have a longer lifespan. Uh, and the forage fish are also crucial for the ecosystem, which we'll get back to soon. Uh, some examples from the North Sea and the Baltic Sea include herring, and brass, and sardine, anchovies, Norway pals, and sandals. We'll hear more about uh, in a moment um, later on in the webinar. But for the Baltic Sea, the main forage fish species are herring and brass, which is what the last part of the report will focus on. Uh, some background on the Baltic Sea as a environment to live in. It's quite challenging for fish species. It's a brackish sea, which I'm sure most of you know, semi-enclosed uh, and relatively shallow. It also has a fairly low biodiversity with fewer species than, for example, the North Sea. Uh, this means that the food web structure will be simpler and interactions between prey and predators also simpler uh, as a result. It also has a temperature gradient as well as a salinity gradient, but more uh, salty water towards the south. Uh, and the oxygen content in the water uh, varies. In some areas, it's completely depleted, causing so called dead seafloor. Uh, it consists of a mix of species with marine and freshwater origin, generally, the marine species then being found further south where the salinity is higher. And the latest uh, Helcom Holas assessment, which is a holistic assessment on the state of the Baltic Sea, it uh, lists a few key. Uh, stressors or pressures 
that are a problem for the Baltic Sea, which include, for instance, eutrophication, pollution, and overfishing. And neither of these are new problems, really, in the Baltic Sea. And on a positive note, the, uh, on the eutrophication side, um, nitrogen and phosphorus is going down. Uh, when it comes to pollution, several of the old uh, legacy compounds are going down, such as uh, PCBs, DDTs, dioxins, which uh, are not really that much in use anymore, but instead there are new emerging contaminants, including PFAS compounds, for instance. Uh, studies of swordfish are also, lo also looking at uh, microplastics in swordfish, as well as the effects of leakage from chemical munitions that have been dumped in the deeper areas of the sea, so chemical warfare agents. Uh, and as I've said, the main swordfish species in the Baltic Sea are the sprats and the herring, and together with cod, these have been the dominating species in terms of um, the commercial interest and also the scientific interest for the Baltic Sea for a long while. Um, they are also some of the most researched fish species in this area. Uh, the herring, which Sara showed you some graphs for, uh, it's consisting of several genetically distinct populations, but the management uh, is done with four different units. Uh, the Bosnian herring, the Gulf of Riga herring, the Central Baltic herring, and the Western spring spawning uh, herring. And out of these, only the Gulf of Riga herring really is doing okay. Uh, herring on a global scale, it's also one of the most researched fish species in the world, as well as one of the most fished species worldwide. Uh, it has the top landed value uh, in the Baltic Sea currently. And it has some cultural importance. We see here some classic ways of eating herring in Sweden. It's a fermented herring as well, uh, which is a, a traditional thing to eat in the north, particularly. We have the pickled herring, which is popular for Easter, Christmas, and Midsummer, uh, as well as fried herring with mashed potatoes. Uh, but at the moment now, uh, the number as well as the size of the individual herring has been going down, and it has been doing that for a while. The sprat, on the other hand, uh, it's managed just as one single unit, and it's doing uh, better comparatively. Uh, here we have on top the spawning stuff biomass for the Baltic sprat, and then comparing to the East and Baltic pod, which is also often connected because you see the big uh, peak in the mid 80s for the Eastern Baltic pod, and then that declined, and instead there was an increase of Baltic sprat. So that's been increasing over the last two decades ish, uh, with a big peak in the, the 1990s. And the system turned from being pod dominated towards more fluid and particularly sprat dominated. Uh, on these graphs, which is the same ones that Sarah showed before with ISIS data, they have. Uh, the same timeline on the x-axis here. Uh, and the sprat is currently the top landed species when it comes to weight in the Baltic Sea. So uh, those are some cultural as well as economic reasons why it's important with swordfish, but they, uh, this presentation will focus more on the ecologically, uh, ecological reasons for the importance. Um, so they form a link swordfish between lower trophic levels and higher trophic levels. And a reduced availability will affect, of course, the predators that want to eat the forage fish, but also the balance of the whole food web. So we have uh, lower trophic levels, including phytoplankton and zooplankton at the bottom here, forage fish in the middle, and different predators at the top. This is, of course, simplified. Uh, and the forage fish then are helping bring energy and nutrients upwards to the trophic levels. Some examples from our literature review now. Uh, and again, this will not cover every single thing that's been published, obviously, because um, this presentation would be very long. Uh, but a lot of the papers are still focused on the Baltic cod. Uh, others are looking at salmon and pike, which are also eating swordfish, uh, different marine mammals and seabirds. Uh, and then we have stickleback, does not eat. Uh, adult forage fish, but it can eat the eggs, and it also uh, is a competitor because it's another plant spore that's been increasing a lot also over the last two decades. 
So the Baltic cod is split into the eastern and the western Baltic cod stock. Uh, the one I showed you earlier was the eastern one that so had very high levels in the 1980s for the spawning stock biomass and then declined. Uh, but now both of these are in poor shape. Uh, more on that in our cod report. Uh, and one of the uh, conclusions there was that a contributing factor to the poor state of the Baltic cod could be the lack of food, including food for adult cod, which is for the fish. Uh, the interaction between cod as well as bat, bat and herring is also one of the most studied uh, in the Baltic Sea. Salmon is another uh, larger fish that likes to eat uh, herring and sprat. Uh, these are, um, well, most of the studies when it comes to salmon are looking at the M74 syndrome, a, a reproductive disorder, uh, which has been a problem for a long while for salmon in the Baltic Sea. This is uh, related to a deficiency of thiamine or vitamin B1. So if there's not uh, enough vitamin B1 in the egg, then there will be a problem for the fry to survive past the yolk stage. Uh, and it's related to uh, an unbalanced diet in the adult. So if they eat a lot of young sprats, for instance, the supply of thiamine will be lower for energy units cons consumed because uh, the lipid content is very high in the young sprats. And that could cause a problem then for the survivability of their egg supply. Uh, the northern pike is a freshwater species uh, and also found in the Baltic Sea, but it's been declining a lot, up to 90% almost, I think. Um, and one factor that a recent review was looking at behind this decline could be the decreased availability of marine prey, including herring, which is a favored uh, prey for lagoon pike. To go back again, uh, as I said, it's been increasing a lot, but in general, there's been a lot of change happening in the Baltic Sea ecosystem. We had the decline of cod, the increase of sprat, the uh, increase of uh, gray seal, uh, and the increase of stickleback, for instance, and the decrease of herring. Uh, stickleback is quite opportunistic, and it's able to adapt to some environmental changes that other fish may not be so favored by. Uh, it's also had a lower predation pressure. Uh, as a result, uh, some people are now looking into whether this could be a commercially fished species in the future. Uh, the pickleback feeds on zooplankton, as well as plantic fauna and fish eggs, as mentioned. Uh, both fish eggs of herring, for instance, but also uh, predators that would eat uh, the pickleback. Pickleback are quite small, as you can see on this uh, photo uh, beneath. and. Um, larger herring are even able to eat stickleback as well. Uh, so the diet overlap then between different planktivores, uh, sprat herring and stickleback can lead to some competition. And the egg predation is of course not great for the herring either. Uh, together with the European perch, um, stickleback is seen as one of the main culprits when it comes to egg predation. Uh, studies have also looked at round goby, an invasive species in the Baltic Sea. Uh, but the effects there on egg predation are likely uh, a lot lower. Marine mammals then, uh, the gray seal I just mentioned as well, has been increasing a lot since the 1980s. And they like to eat both herring and sprat, uh, but particularly the large herring. Uh, connected to this is also the seal parasites, which have changed or increased in prevalence since the seal increase. Uh, and some studies are looking now at whether Sport fish can act as intermediary host for the liverworm, for instance, the parasite from the seal. And it seems like maybe they can. Uh, ring seal and harbor porpoise are other marine mammals that are uh, happy to eat herring as well. Uh, when it comes to seabirds, they also can act as marine top predators. Um, there are different species of birds being looked at, including uh, different gull species, cormorants, but in particular the common moor and the razorbill, the both hawks, uh, and uh, that's where we have the most detailed foraging data available for forage fish, uh, particularly in the area of Sura Karlsa, which is in this hotspot for uh, seabirds in the Baltic Sea between the Swedish islands of Öland and Gotland. Uh, yeah, so different. Uh, Pelagic seabirds are able to use sprat and herring as their prey. Uh, 
Uh, and lastly, we have the actual prey that the sports fish themselves eat. As I managed to mention, they are an important ecological link between lower and higher trophic levels. So they eat both zooplankton and also phytoplankton. But one of the main prey are different species of copepods. Uh, this is a group of small crustaceans. You can see one example of the top right uh, image. Uh, and there's an overlap, quite a considerable one, between bat and herring, leading to competition. So there's also uh, selectivity and specialization looked at in different studies that show that they're obviously still able to coexist. Uh, the diet also changes with the size and age of the fish when they're able to hunt more, uh, and also depends on the geographic location in the Baltic Sea, as well as the season and time of day even. So um, they will eat what's available and also move uh, in order to find food, uh, both seasonal migration and also vertical migration up and down in the water column. In summary, the Baltic Sea is a challenging environment to live in, uh, and the ecosystem has changed a lot over time. Swordfish are important for a number of different predators, but also for the balance of the entire ecosystem. Uh, and in general, swordfish species are really important for marine ecosystems and their health. Uh, with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening, and hand back to Irene. Thank you so much. I realized just now that um, I am only identified here as the fishery secretariat. I do have another oh. identity. So <laughs> hello, everyone. My name is Irene Kingma. I am the um, uh, international coordinator for the fishery secretariat. So I do the contact with uh, NGOs outside of Sweden. And as you might have heard, I'm not Swedish. Um, I'm from the country that eats herring raw by the tail, the Netherlands. Um, so let's see. So I opened the chat now as well um, for any questions to Lina and Sarah. So either the Q&A or the chat can be used if anybody has any questions. Um, I uh, found it when Lina um, gave this presentation earlier quite insightful, this whole interaction with particularly, particularly the stickleback that is now all of a sudden uh, booming very much in the Baltic because, well, I, I'm not the expert, so, uh, Lina is, but um, it seems to be that the big predators are leaving and now all of a sudden the whole, the whole uh, Baltic is filled with stickleback and all of a sudden there's a, a question of can we have a profitable fishery of stickleback? It's, it seems to be a kind of definition of fishing down the food web. Although, of course, it's never as straightforward as it is because Lina immediately said to me, yeah, but there's been tickle bed booms in the past. So it's sort of a thing that they do as well. So um, um, so that's, I found that quite insightful. And also, Lina, just a bit on the seal parasites. So they do get them also already from herring or is it just not really sure where they... I think there's not that much uh, done on that compared to cod, for instance. Uh, but there was a study comparing brass, older brass versus uh, uh, newer brass data, and then they did see that there was liver worm in the newer data. Okay. Uh, was done a few years ago, but uh, I think there's maybe a lot more work to be done there. Oh. Okay. Yeah. okay. I see that Charles still has his hand up, but maybe he's just you know waving at us. Hi, Charles. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat or the Q&A, so it means very clear. So anybody, um, so we are recording this webinar. It will be av made available through the FishSec YouTube. Um, yeah, Clara, can you put your question in the chat? Because uh, I don't have a function to unmute the attendees, I'm afraid. If you have a question. I think it's, I'm also being multitasking as I am, I am also uh, an, in another identity in over here. The chat should work. See, it's going. Hmm. I just put something in the chat, but I'm not seeing it. Yes, there we are. So there we are. 
see, I'm also I'm also an attendee just to make sure everything is uh, working well. Okay, there we are. Sorry, I cannot read the chat when I'm in this mode. Uh, I can read the chat. Yes, oh, there we are. Yes, there's a question from Jean-Christophe van der Veld. Uh, I was wondering if forage fish were considered differently than other fish in terms of management by the EU. This is a great question. This is something that we will cover in the next webinar. Um, the quick answer is yes. Um, the some uh, it's yes and no. Uh, yes, some of them are like spread. They're they're considered uh, in industrial fisheries, and they have a different um, way of getting their advice. So this advice cycle that Sarah showed. There's different ways of, of getting advice, and for spread, it's it's different. Herring has its own very intense management um, on it, and um, so there are classifications between the larger sizes. So there, there's letters for them A, B, C, D sizes of herring that are managed differently, that are treated differently in management. But um, the idea is that we will have. Uh, two more of these webinars, or maybe one more, and then we'll have the launch of the report. We'll just see how, how interesting this third part of, the, of, of our report is. But our second webinar will be going to more in details in the fisheries themselves around the Baltic and how they are managed. Does that answer your question for now? And also, if anybody has great... Uh, uh... Oh! Uh, Lina, good question from Catherine. What do you know? Ever find anything about the decline in zooplankton? I think one aspect there could be the climate change, for instance, that they're quite sensitive to. Uh, but I think they also vary a bit naturally as well. I would need to look into that a little bit more because I've been more focused on the port fish than the zooplankton uh, levels, actually. But uh, thank you for the question. Okay, if there are no more questions, we'll move on to the next section of our webinar. And we are incredibly grateful to welcome Amy Sesford, who is, um, um, oh God, now I have to go back to my notes. I'm so sorry. A policy lead for the North Sea, West of Scotland and the Deep Sea Fishers from the UK government. And Bernadette Butfield, who is Senior Policy Officer in the UK Marine Team at the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, RSPB for short. Um, and I've invited him, and also on the call is Ian Glasgow. He is uh, uh, sort of backup for uh, uh, Imogen, who worked together with her at the UK government on uh, North Sea fisheries. Um, we invited them because... Um, uh, just when we were putting this webinar together, there was news from the UK that they have now um, uh, closed fisheries for sand eel in UK waters. And sand eel, of course, also a forage fish that uh, has a similar role uh, in the food web as the as the, the small herring and sand eel that Lina just presented on. So I had invited them to um, just talk a little bit about uh, how this came about, the thinking behind it. From the RSBB's perspective, they did a lot of advocacy to get this ban um, for at least two decades. And Emmy is more on the side of, well, you know, it finally came about and how did that happen? Um, just to kick us off, Emmy has a short presentation on just because we are all EU specialists, we might not exactly know how you know, uh, the, the fisheries management in the UK works. So um, Amy, I will give the floor to you now to give a presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ina, for inviting us to this call to talk about our recent announcement regarding the closure of English waters to fishing for sand deal. Um, hopefully you can, can see those slides. So. Um, as I know, mentioned, uh, I'm Imogen Sesford and I lead the policy for North Sea and Deep Sea Fisheries in the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs in the UK government. Um, and I'm also joined by Ian on the call, who within my team has really led the policy development for Sand Deal. So just to talk a little bit about um, what the UK has been doing on Sand Deal, 
you can see um, on the slides that last month, um, as Irina mentioned, we announced that we intend to close English waters of the North Sea to fishing for sand deal. And these closures will be in place from the 26th of March, ready for the start of the fishing year in April. Scotland have similarly announced to close Scottish waters for fishing for sand eel, so that forms really part of kind of a whole UK package. The closures will apply to all vessels and cover the main sand eel habitats in the UK. In terms of why the UK is closing waters to fishing for sand eel, the closure has been developed in line with our legislative and policy commitments. I'm conscious, obviously, as Alina mentioned, um, I'm sure not all of you will be um, that familiar with kind of what we've got in place in the UK. Um, but it's as we work towards achieving good environmental status and meeting the objectives of the UK Fisheries Act, which really um, is our kind of key piece of leg legislation which describes the management of, of fisheries post EU exit, as well as the joint fisheries statement, which um, is a statement across all the fisheries administrations in the UK and talks through how we're going to deliver our objectives in the Act. So on this slide, we talk through in particular the ecosystem objective, which um, is a really important objective that sets out how, uh, or you know, makes the ambition that um, fish and aquaculture activities will be managed using an ecosystem-based approach so as to ensure that their negative impacts on marine ecosystems are minimized and where possible reversed. Um, so that's just one of the fisheries objectives um, that have been taken into consideration here. The closures themselves will improve the survivability condition and reproduction of commercially and ecologically important uh, species which prey on sand deal and in particular we expect to see increased resilience of seabird populations and I have some nice diagrams that have been put together uh, for us by Natural England, one of our um, what we call in the UK our arm's length uh, bodies which really sort of helped to illustrate this. Um, let me move to those now because they're much more exciting. So here we go. Um, this is this is one of them. Um, so you can see here really that there are some kind of commercially important fish species that are likely to benefit from the greater food availability as well as marine mammals such as baleen and, and toothed whales. And finally, here is a breakdown of um, the specific bird species with respect to diet proportion of sand deal. So you can really see from this that particularly kitty wakes, puffins, razorbills, etc., are standing to benefit from the closure. So that's my final slide. I'll leave it there. Um, and I did put my um, email address at the beginning. So if you would like to get in touch and, and know more, please, please do reach out. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, it's very insightful and um, uh, nice, succinct introduction. Um, to kick us off with the questions, I would like to start with Bernadette because um, the RSBB is um, that, that, that is a, a, a good question for BirdLife for later on. But first, it was a question for for Bernadette. Um, um, uh, so you advocated, so the RSB really advocated so strongly, and what were sort of your observations on the field, or what, what, what were your, were, why did you think, okay, this is actually something that uh, we really need to be working on? Yeah, um, thanks, Irene, and yeah, thanks for having us on this um, webinar today. It's really great to join you all and to just cover this topic at a wider scale. Um, I should say that I joined the UK Marine team back in October, and so I joined the sand eel work very, very late on. So I really cannot take credit for the push that that's been um, done by the the team over the last twenty years. And a real legacy in this work is Dr. Ewan Dunn, and he sort of um, came across this work back um, twenty years ago. And then pulled together as sort of a retirement piece of work, um, we can call it, when he left the RSPB, a report in um, in back in um, 2021 that sort of set out a clear case that justified why we need this to happen. 
Um, and that was kind of a really great consolidation piece of work that um, allowed us to to go forward in the last few years and to really try and work with the government to make sure that this this closure happened. Um, a lot of the the work that Ewan did over his time with the RSPB was bringing together all of that science and that evidence. Um, and I can circulate that report for for anyone that might be interested. I can pop it in the chat as well. But that that piece was really useful for us um, to make sure that we sort of push this evidence over the line. Um, from an RSPB perspective, going forward from that report, there are some kind of key lessons that we've reflected on as to how we think that um, our work in this has supported the closures. Um, so we have that report, which is that great piece of evidence base there. And then there's also the kind of political framing. So for seabirds in the UK, we know that they've been declining rapidly over the last few decades. And since uh, spring 2022, we've also had highly pathogenic avian influenza or HPAI, avian flu, hitting um, seabird populations across the UK. So working with the government, it was kind of clear that we needed to make sure um, some action was taken that would make considerable benefits. And the sand eel closures were one of those, those things. Um, so it's sort of that political framing that we had as well. Um, so those are just a a couple of things hopefully that gives you a flavor for sort of the work that we were doing in this space but happy to answer more i don't know for sure but as soon as you mentioned you and dan um, with whom i worked a lot when i was still vice chair of the north sea advisory council um the big smile to my face I'll, I'll text him that we gave him a shout out today <laughs> so uh... um I think that's more for the second webinar, the question I see popping in now. Um, so the question I wanted to ask uh, to Imi as well is sort of, um, uh, where does this closure sit? Is it the fisheries measure or is it an MPA measure more? And does it fit in the bigger fishery scheme or is it more like uh, separated out? Thank you. Yeah, so um, it's a measure that, I mean, it's not so quite distinct in the way that we, we talk about it, I suppose. So um, the measure is in place to protect and um, support the um, improvement of various species. So um, it's a, a closure for fisheries that has a, a wide range of benefits. And does, does that feed into the sort of the wider UK management as well that you're thinking more sort of like this because uh, we're uh, always talking about of course nature-based um, uh, ecosystem-based management and that that is, is is it sort of like in the grounding in that as well? Yeah thank you and I, I think probably that speaks a bit to Daniel's question in the chat as well around kind of what a um, more holistic approach to the management of forage fish species in UK waters might might look like. And I think we're really keen to kind of hear thoughts on, on what that might mean for, for various organisations as well. Um, of course, as I set out at the beginning, we have the kind of context of our Fisheries Act, which has the ecosystem objective within that. Um, and, you know, we're required to be um, balancing all of the objectives within, within the Act as we kind of set our plans for fisheries management. Um, but yes, we are, you know, really keen to hear more from from those who kind of have thoughts about um, next steps and and what um, what people would like to see um, in the future. Okay. okay. Well, that's also covers sort of Justina's question and sort of like, okay, this is an ongoing process, and you're looking for. Uh, views and opinions of people. And I think also the same, the question is sort of like, who is fishing these fish? It's also more our second webinar where we are trying to, because I have no expertise on that. It's sort of, I know from uh, government side is, that is, this is still a negotiation ongoing process to where, where things land. Um, um, but that, what would you see, like, uh, what would your ideal world going forward be? From, from this closure and where the for, where forage fish in relation to bird species would land? Yeah, <clears throat> this is a really progressive step that's been taken from the UK government and the Scottish government. Um, and it will really 
as we we've been advocating, it will be the single largest benefit that we have to our seabird populations in the UK at the moment. And it should really make some steps towards achieving good environmental status, which we know is something that that other countries should also be making steps towards achieving as well. Um, so it's really, really progressive and, and should really be celebrated. But going forward, we'd like to kind of maintain this momentum and expand that out to other forage fish species. So as we've heard today, there's a lot of others um, that we need to be considering. And these will have wider benefits to other marine taxa. So exploring that, gaining more evidence is really key. And then seeing what the wider measures should encompass as well. Um, so in that sort of just a movement towards ecosystem-based fisheries management in the UK is, mm. is pretty key. Um, and that's something that we'll be working on going forwards. And does that also include like spatial management? Like we saw just the presentation by Lena that this air, so areas like the area between Orland and Gotland, it's like, oh, this is actually where all the all the seabirds are. So it's sort of like, I imagine that encompasses those elements too. Yeah, of course, spatial management measures in terms of fisheries management measures within marine protected areas and the MPA network that we have in the UK, those are key to make sure that we get those in place and that they're effective and they're well monitored so that we can move towards more favorable conservation status being achieved throughout the whole of the MPA network in the UK. Um, and of course, some of the things I'm saying here are very specific to the UK. So apologies to those that aren't working in that space. And then wider outside of the MPAs, it's really important to remember that fisheries management covers the whole of the other, the remaining space that isn't um, held within those boundaries. So adjusting catch limits to account for sand eel closures, marine protected areas that have fisheries management measures that incite form of closures on fisheries as well is really key. So moving towards that ecosystem based approach to setting the limits, making sure that we have some form of predator set aside encompassed into how we're setting those limits as well. These are the sorts of things that we're going to be working towards hoping to achieve in the next few years. Gonna do a, do, do another quote uh, of of you and Dan here. He he said, "Well, actually, it should have a third for the birds in the models, the foraging behavior. So just put set aside a third for the birds. I like that line. It's I, mean, I don't know if it's correct, but it's it's stuck with me. Um, thank you so much. I see. By the way, Henrike, thank you for your question in the chat. Uh, we discussed it a little bit after Lina's presentation. That is going to be available online." It seems to be your question is more sort of uh, related to the advice setting and the ISIS and that um, we are covering that within our report on the Baltic Sea uh, fisheries, but we are, um, this is only, uh, we are not, we haven't written, the, Lena hasn't written that chapter yet, so we, we don't, that's going to be the next webinar, so I'll hopefully come back then. Um, and then to, uh, to Amy. Um, so what would you say that uh, something is that you want to like advise questions you want to put out there to our uh, EU audience here? We also have people coming from a fishing background and a policy background, a European Commission background. Sort of how would you ideally continue communicating about this closure and about future management measures to come? Thank you. Yeah, we were giving giving some thought to this uh, this question. And so I think a really key one is around bringing together the evidence from, from experts and ensuring that that's going to be in a form that's understandable to a range of stakeholders as well. Um, you know, as part of developing our uh, proposals and closure, we undertook um, a, a consultation um, which sought input from, from all of our stakeholders on, on what we were uh, thinking in that space. And then DEFRA also was commissioning internal evidence on, on the ecosystem role of, of species targeted um, by um, fisheries on these species with, with experts from, from those bodies that I mentioned, such as Natural England and CFAS. And also kind of working together with ICs um, around and their advice as well. So bringing together that kind of whole picture of evidence, I think, is, is really important to make sure that any measures that are, are developed are evidence based. 
um, but also that uh, a consideration of, of proportionality is, is a really important part of that in terms of impacts too. Um, so publicising that evidence and, and consulting widely, I guess, would be some of my kind of key recommendations. And then particularly as well, I think, you know, building into the plans for any kind of future management, the need to, um, you know, consider new advice as it becomes available and, and new evidence as, as that um, as that comes up. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that would be my my sort of reflections on that question. Thanks. Is there anything else you want to add to that, Ian? Because I'm um, quite aware that we uh, invited you as a panelist and you haven't been given the floor yet. Um, no, I agree entirely with what um, Amy has said. Um, I agree, you know, it's, it's very important that we bring together as much expert evidence as possible. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also import important to publicize that evidence as widely as we can as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, let's see if there's, the chat has anything to go. Catherine, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but this is an ISIS question <laughs> that we are not answering in this webinar. Net. It's a very good question, and I know there is discussion on it, and it's definitely, it also depends on which model you take. It might be different in a herring model than in a spread model, but it's definitely not something that uh, is complete consensus on if that's enough or if it's, if it's correct. So there's definitely some room for uh, at least discussion on where so the question was sorry if you hadn't seen it how you know how far does does the, does the predator prey relationship mm -hmm. feature in isis modeling uh for uh how much extraction of uh, uh forage fish is sustainable and that's sort of a, a i know that there is discussion on it i we don't have, not have the answer that you're not we're hopefully gonna cover that in a next webinar where we might have a q a with uh, people who actually work on those models which will be quite interesting so this leads me, I think, to the end of this webinar. Thank you so much for attention, attending. Thank you a lot to our panelists. Thank you to our presenters. Um, I will, or one of us at FishTech will email out uh, the recording once, once we've um, done. Oh, by the way, any beautiful visuals you've seen in the presentations and the logo, Lina is not really not only a very smart scientist, but also a great designer. So she will now do her work her magic and and have a nice header and things for the uh, YouTube video. Um, and uh, oh, thank you for the panelists are actually answering in the chat as well. It's very useful. Uh, I will also um, uh, any any links to useful papers you have, send them to me or Lena or Sarah. We can add those to uh, the email we'll send out once the webinar is online. And we'll also add the you and done paper on the forage fish to that as well, to link to that, because those are great resources to have. And we should make a lot of use of those. So uh, with that, I would like to thank everyone and um, for your attention and wish you all a lovely Friday.